Welcome to Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. My name is Mumpulu Kiluruma Mohobe. Our objective is to enthuse, inspire, energize, and empower entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs of all stripes here in BW and beyond. We do so by inviting these entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs into our makeshift studio. Sometimes we call them to the restaurant, sometimes we go uh, to our studio and we ask them to share their experiential knowledge, their experiences and their expertise. And we ask them uh, as many questions as we can aimed at empowering you also as a viewer. Hello dear viewer and dear listener, my name is Mumpulu Kiluruma Mohobe. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. We do our best to bring impactful, life-changing, uh, entrepreneurial information each and every time. And this time I'm not going to disappoint you because I have a great, great, great entrepreneur, a colleague, a friend in, the, in business, uh, Mr. Ibrahim Mohammed. Welcome to the studio. Hi, Mr. Mohammed. How are you? Um, I always want my guests to be the ones introducing themselves. Just share with the listeners who you are in terms of your background, what you do for a living, and um, you know your entrepreneurial, your current entrepreneurial ventures. Okay. Mm. All right, listeners, Ibrahim Mohammed, uh, founder, CEO of O3 Beverages in Botswana, as you this can one. see. Of, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, former basically employee and part of the founding structure of Knockout Cash and Carry. Um, now also part of a collective of entrepreneurs called Tsukha Africa, where we work with entrepreneurs to try and scale them up locally and throughout Africa. Yeah, that's it. So you're originally with, um, you know, Knockout Cash and yes. Carry, and it's, it's basically um, a different type of business, isn't it? From totally. Tell us about that one and a little bit about the transition to water. Uh, look, Knockout Cash and Carry was literally my education to the world. Um, to be honest with you, it was learning uh, of consumerism, learning who our consumers are in, in this country. And being part of that structure and, and the growth of that company was vitally, vitally important to who I am today. Um, dealing with suppliers, mm -hmm. dealing with marketing and learning what sort of marketing works. Uh, mm. In any entrepreneurial business, I believe that sales is your mm -hmm. key focus. If you don't have sales, you don't have a business. So Knockout Cash and Carry taught me how to sell and who our, to who our consumers are. What was your actual position in the company? Uh, I was CEO for, for a long time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, how that long is long time? About five years. Eh? Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. And um, that was, I think I only realized that you, I was a CEO after those five years. Mm. Um, it, was, it was straight out hustling, um, no real structure. I mean, at that time I was 16 years old mm. um, and, and grew the company till I was about 22. Mm -hmm. uh, and you grew it from what size to? Oh, what size? How? I was part of a structure that we grew the company from one store, 300 square meters, to now 13 stores mm. around the country. Okay. The thing we're going to talk about today is entrepreneurial vision. Yeah. The, the vision of an entrepreneur based on your life story, based on your experiences. I suppose this, the starting point would just be to define vision. What is vision and how do you... How do you articulate your own vision? You know, vision is one of those things that every tool in an entrepreneur's, to, entrepreneur's toolbox mm. works towards. Um, vision is the foundation of every enterprise and every business, even every government. Um, without vision, we could have the best tools, mm. but we will not be working towards anything. So my main focus today is to talk about how do we actually visualize? How do we envision what we want to do? Mm -hmm. And as an entrepreneur in today's world, through pandemics, through all the struggles we go through, the vision has to be bigger, broader than anything we can have ever imagined. Mm -hmm. We look at the great entrepreneurs of our time. We look at the great leaders of the past. 
sad to say, even the bad leaders mm -hmm. had great visions. Mm. And that's how they managed to rope in so much around them because all they had to sell, Martin Luther King, mm. when he stood on the leader, stage yeah. and yeah. said, I have a dream. Yes. That was a vision. Mm. And people till today mm. fall behind his vision. Mm. Equality is based on what Martin Luther King had said. Mm. And we focus too much on the grimy tools, which mm. definitely need focus on, on the day-to-day -day runnings. But if we lose focus on our vision, mm. we, we're just going through the mill. Okay. In terms of your own experience in your reading, who would you consider at the moment to be a visionary leader that you, know, you are emulating or would you say is, is mentoring you, either directly or indirectly? Look, um, the greatest visionaries in, in my life that have played a role have been um, messengers like Jesus, mm. messengers like Muhammad. Mm. People who had a vision that came from, divi from divine sources mm. and were managed to, till today collecting people behind this vision. Mm. Those were great visionaries. Their messages were so strong. And in today's world, when I look at the business side, Elon Musk, who set out a few years ago and said, I'm going to go to Mars. Mm. And to be honest with you, let's be real, nobody, it, believed, nobody him. believed him, <laughs> but he had the vision. Mm. And today, one of the wealthiest man's, men in the world and mm. still promising mm. on his delivery of we're going to Mars. Mm. Everything else around Tesla, let's be honest. Tesla fell, as well. Yeah, but fell around the vision mm. of something so big mm. that humanity actually sat back and was like, we want to see this happen. Mm. And look how he grew exponentially during the COVID days. You know, oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's amazing that when you have a great vision, because a vision is not tangible, mm. you cannot hold a vision. It is a feeling that it leaves a person inside. Okay. And that's where I believe we as Africans, we as Botswana need to really focus on is what is our vision if it's something we can feel touch or hold mm. it's not a vision mm -hmm. it's something that leaves the next person with a feeling okay this leads to my obvious question when we talk about zero three yeah what was the compelling vision if you like that really got it started and that got you interested <laughs> and the water is very lovely by the way. <laughs> thank, thank you, you so <laughs> much thank you <laughs> you know i I could stand here and say all the beautiful things of, you know, it took me, I thought about it. And, and to be honest with you, it was one of the many things that I wanted, I, I, I wanted to try. Mm. And due to a lot of luck and hard work, um, it became the first water brand in the country uh, when, when we started. And it was one of those businesses where I was a bit challenged uh, mm. by many people, my, you know, many people in the family, many people from outside friends and said, give me it, And I was like, yeah. And they said, how are you going to sell it? I said, well, if I can sell something which tastes like water, looks like water, and actually is water, mm. then I can sell anything else. Mm. So it became something that I challenged myself completely mm -hmm. and then also realized that I couldn't sell water. Mm -hmm. I needed to sell something bigger than water. Bigger than water. And what we decided to do then, and it was by pure luck again, just by trying many reiterations of things, is we sold the intangible. What does this brand say to you? Mm -hmm. How does it make you feel? What is it that we want to achieve by somebody who consumes this product. Because let's be honest, it's water. Mm. Yes, we, there's a huge purification systems and many things that go on in the actual yeah. making of it. But to the actual consumer, give me it. Mm. Ultimately. So we had to build a brand um, that created a feeling mm -hmm. that when people bought it, was it an aspiration? Was it to do with health? 
was it to do with things that mattered to the consumer. And we had to really drill down and focus on that. Mm. At that time, it was somehow or another the perfect route to success for the company. Wow. And zero three, does it have special meaning? Why the zero, why the three? Okay, um, at O3, it, it, it was basically... I, O3, not yeah. zero three. It's important yeah. to get it right. Yeah. Um, at O3, it was, again, pure luck. Um, one of the e equipment that we bought in it said, you know, we're going to oxygen, ozonize your water and so forth. And I saw this, this logo on the side. And whenever I try and build brands, I want it to be as easy as possible for the consumer one to say and two to recognize. Mm -hmm. So we made the O big, we made the three small, you know, something that, that, that was picturesque as well, mm -hmm. but in its, in its most simple, simple format. Mm. At that time, I was also going through a bit of a, I would say a spiritual journey and started trying to understand the mind of a human being. So what triggers certain things in the mind of the human being? And mm simplicity, certain colors, what do the colors mean to the brain, how is the, the reactive, how does it react? Mm. And yeah, we came out with this. And what I also noticed is that the, the pure water uh, is blue, the bottle, yeah. and sparkling is green. Yeah. Is there some thinking behind that? Um, it, w it was basically mainly to, to separate the two visually, mm -hmm. but keep the element of purity in mind. Okay. The other aspect is we designed, this, this bottle is a patent um, of ours, uh, we, we manufacture them in Botswana and so forth. And every cut and every line on this bottle is based on the princess cut of a diamond. Oh. Yeah. So okay. it was there to put national pride inside. But at the same time, we didn't want to push it and sell that model so hard. We wanted people to feel it. Mm -hmm. So the subconscious selling point to a consumer is the most valuable selling point any entrepreneur should look at that how can i make a product or a business or a service that enters into the subconscious of a consumer where it becomes a reactive buy mm -hmm. rather than a proactive buy yes yes which that takes us to our next point which mm. is really about brand vision mm. um is a brand vision part and parcel of the entrepreneur or is the entrepreneur inextricably tied or linked to the vision of his brand? The entrepreneur, when, when building a brand, uh, has to separate himself from the brand. Uh, it's like a child who becomes a teenager. As much as we try and mold that being to be what we would like them to be, mm. they become the best that they can be when they are free to be what they would like to be. Yes. And I always say when we, when we start a brand and we start a company, we lay the foundation strong enough for that brand to explode into what it can be. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we as leaders and entrepreneurs in a business are the hampering of the growth of the brand because what we believe is right may not be right. Mm, mm. And we set, up all, we set up all the systems, all the, the tools needed for that brand to be. And most importantly, when, when visualizing a brand or a business and envision as well, make sure the statement that you make to yourself every morning, stick it up on your toilet door or do something, has people in mind. If a vision does not impact people, it is not a vision. Mm -hmm. And go back in history and look at all the great visionaries. The people we read history about were people who did things for people. Not for themselves? Not for themselves. Yes. Hmm. And what, where, so... That is so powerful. So, so the, 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 the entrepreneur has to stop navel-gazing and just focusing on themselves. Uh, Pretty much, I, Mr. Mohobe, I, I come from a school of thought that believes we are not in this world alone. Mm. And if we believe 
that out of the seven point something billion people in this world, mm. that our success means anything in the greater picture. I think we, we're on the wrong track. Mm. It is the success of how do I impact the people around. Which leads me to my next point, which is how does your brand and what you do, we'll, we'll deal with other businesses later, but let's confine yourself to water and to um, O3. How does it impact society? How does it impact your community? And how do you hope your business is going to continue to impact the community? You know, it was a very, very strong message from my grandmother who, who lived in, in Zambia. Mm. And um, growing up, she used to feed many people. And I always used to watch the family and everyone question her to say, you know, mama, how are you feeding all these people? We don't know where tomorrow's meal is going to come for ourselves, yet you're feeding people. Mm. And she said something to me that, that really impacted me till today. She said, when it comes to food and water, listen to the way you are asked. Mm. And we said, oh, wow, what does listen that mean? Listen to the way you, you are asked. asked. Yeah. If somebody says, can I please have some food? He says, you will never charge that person. Mm. If somebody says, can I please buy some food? Then you charge the person. Yeah. And I said, and as a young boy, it, it made no sense. But mm -hmm. going into business, it made sense. So when we started this business, and the way we got our brand literally throughout this whole country mm -hmm. and in, across borders mm -hmm. was based on, if somebody asked, I said, yeah. Mm. Just like that? Just like that. It, it burned, uh, I mean, the bottom line, financially, it looked terrible mm. but f took about three years and the consumer then remembered the intangible part mm. of you wanted something this company gave it to me I will support that mm -hmm. and the full support came from that wow. today we are told I mean the textbook is not going to tell you about the things that you cannot measure mm. I mean, we were on the brink of shutting down maybe 15 times in six years. You had those, uh, those moments where, oh, and how do you think you survived that? What was the, the trick? What was the difference maker? How did you survive those crises, multiple crises? Believing in my vision mm. to impact people, to, to give people a source of a brand that it is possible in this country mm. to look at something with pride and say this was every bit of this brand was built in this country the people that manage this brand are from this country this is wow. what what keeps this going today you mentioned your grandmother yeah. and i often want to ask entrepreneurs is an entrepreneur born or is he made? And, you know, based on your experience, would you say that you were born an entrepreneur or you, m you became one through experience? I think the journey is due to the, the successes and not successes of people my parents and my family surrounded me with. Growing up um, as a child, I remember traveling with my father on business trips, yes. not knowing what I was going in for, sitting in boardrooms, you know, deals being made. I mean, watching my father and mother washing cars mm. in Botswana, you know, really? th that, that's where they started. Mm. And, you know, looking at that and things that were not, and I think that was a big trigger point in my life where things that were not done for them, but done for me. Mm -hmm that if somebody could wake up every morning and sacrifice everything that they have, not for them, but for me, mm. made me want to do that for more people. Mm. So I don't get into businesses. I've been offered many opportunities to go into businesses where I can make personally a lot of money for myself. Mm. And I've turned it down and I've I've been brought up in a way to say, well, 
what am I going to do with it? Mm. Tell us a little bit more, which part of Botswana and what was the environment like? Because I think you've answered my question that mm. you're basically born an entrepreneur because you you brought up by entrepreneurs yeah. and then you developed your skills as you're growing mm. because of what they were doing, the way they brought you up. Yeah. Look, um, it all happened in Khaproni, in, in broadest. I mm. mean, I grew up playing Sunday soccer in Taung in mm. 27. I mean, those are th that's my home because mm. my father's car wash was literally in those mm. areas there. Mm. So get picked up from school, put there, you know, mm. got to understand uh, different cultures and, and which became my culture, mm. you know, and uh, understood. And at that point, I don't think we we looked at each other based on, we didn't measure people. Mm. And I think that is a secret source that not many entrepreneurs talk about, is the moment you start measuring people, you know, on their wealth or who they are and where they come mm. from and everything, you're actually narrowing your you're vision. Yeah, you're limiting what you can, you can get even out of those people in terms of, you know, yeah. um, the energy levels in terms of the input. Yeah. You know? yeah. And watching that system unfold in front of my eyes mm. was the greatest education that I ever had. I mean, I dropped out of high school um, mm. to, to start working because it made no sense to me at the time. And, and please, I, I believe in education now because it took me a lot of painful lessons after that. But Go, go and get educated. Mm. But while you're in high school, have a vision of mm. what you would like to do. So all the tools start making sense. Wh so what do you say about parents who continually say, get a degree, find a good company, work hard, and then you'll be successful. Isn't that uh, model falling off a little bit? I think there's a, there's a positive and a negative. Um, the positive side of it is we it does something to our brain in our subconscious that tells us that the degree is going to give us security, which 99.9% .9 of the time, maybe it does. Mm. The, pl the downside of it is education makes the tools very too valuable for the entrepreneur. So the tools then become th the actual reason why A may succeed or may not succeed, mm. which is not the actual fact. Yeah. Um, I still believe that the vision is if the vision is powerful enough, the tools will fall into place. Mm, mm. The sad reality is, Mr. Mokhobe, till today, I believe I'm the least educated person in all my organizations. <laughs> you surround yourself with smart people. Yeah, it <laughs> makes me look very clever. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm going to ask you a technical question because yeah. you're a technical person. Mm. What is the difference between adaptive um, adaptive challenge. Yeah, adaptive problems or technical versus technical problems. Adaptive, adaptive problems versus technical problems. That's what I wanted to say. The technical problems are the problems we as humanity love, mm. because I've s I sit with many entrepreneurs, and the first thing they're like, you know, if I had one million pula, I would be able to do X, Y, and Z. Mm. And when you actually have a conversation, it's not a million pula that they need. They may need a million pula five years from now, mm. but a technical problem is a problem that money can solve. Mm -hmm. An adaptive problem is a problem money can't solve. Today we're in a pandemic. Mm. We sit in a world where we are unsure what tomorrow holds. Is that a technical problem? Mm. You can have all the money in the world. It will not solve your problem. <laughs> That's true. But if you have an adaptive personality mm -hmm. to adapt to the situations, you have more success. Because through the adaptive, technical issues become your least worry. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I tell people, you know, they'll be like, I want to make a bag of chips and I need a factory to make a bag of chips. And I said, we don't even know what your chips taste like. Mm. Why would we buy a machine to make some chips? Says, no, I need the machine 
to make the chips? And I said, no. You don't need, you a, don't machine. need a machine to make the chips. You need to first make the chips. You need to first make the chips and get people to taste it and get, and get ready for the criticism. Because mm. the criticism is going to make you adapt to make the best chips. Mm. Only then, when you've already got to that level, yes. proof of concept, do you then buy the machine? And I mean, I, I watched your show with um, Arun uh, mm. from Alpha Direct, mm. an amazing financial guy. Absolutely, and absolutely <laughs> fantastic yeah. guy. Mm. An amazing financial guy. And, you know, we're, we're discussing about venture capitals and, uh, and so forth. And let's look at what venture capitals actually want. Venture capitals want to look at where their money is not the actual solution to the problem. Yeah, yeah, now that <laughs> you put it that way, that's, yeah. yeah. Because they're more interested in the entrepreneur. They're more interested in the entrepreneur. And they want to establish whether he's got those skills, adaptive yeah. problem solving. Uh, adaptive problem solving skills, because the venture capitals are like, well, m let's look at it in a nutshell that, well, if I said that, why don't we invest in the O3 factory? Mm -hmm. They'll be like, well, we could buy machines anywhere for anyone to produce water. What mm. would the venture capital want is to invest in the brand. So why do you, why, uh, is, is the pandemic there for, because we're in the middle of the pandemic mm. or uh, hopefully getting out of it, would you say that the, the pandemic is an adaptive challenge or a technical challenge? Totally, totally adaptive. Um, the issue we have in Botswana and, and a lot in Southern Africa is we, we, we in search of a technical solution. Mm. And we are pounding, we are stressing our minds out and spending a lot of time looking for a technical solution. Let's be honest, it's this pandemic today. Call it, God forbid, 10 years from now, there's another one. Mm. What are we going to look for again? Another technical solution? Well, if we teach ourselves so our next generation can adapt to situations better, mm -hmm. we have got a foolproof solution mm. to the problem. So in businesses, we, 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 we start by looking at a challenge from a technical point of view, which is a financial. Mm -hmm. And then we, we start saying, okay, well, to eliminate the financial, we will start doing X, Y, and Z, and everything becomes a very technical solution. But the business, we, we don't sit in the boardroom and say, how do we adapt ourselves to this situation? And then money just becomes a tool to solve those problems. Mm -hmm. wow. Because if we're, if we're not prepared to change our ways to adapt to different situations. Yeah, obviously one would be curious to know how you've adapted. Mm -hmm. First of all, how did COVID affect your business? Yeah. And B, how did you do affect? Uh, adapt to the situation? Look, COVID was the worst, I would say, six months we've had in that business. Mm. Um, you know, and everyone asked, well, are you going to let people off? Are you paying half salaries and all of that? And I said, no, we're not. Mm. And um, says, what are you going to do differently in that? I said, we're going to sell harder. Mm. I said, so, we're, so going harder. To, we're going to become Every person in the institution, whether it was a person working on the factory, whether it was the CEO or the CFO, or everyone became salespeople. And we made sure that all we wanted to do was sell enough water to pay for the people. And we very drilled it down from, from our board and everyone else that this is for our people. This is not for us. We're, we're going to push out what, whatever it takes and then come out of it. Maybe we'll become even bigger mm -hmm. because we spent this time adapting to that situation. I don't know what the future holds. I mean, we, we never know. But the objective of it was from a purity of intention to say we're going to sell harder so we can continuously pay our people through these hard times. Wow. That's beautiful. I love that. Um, now, you're involved in other businesses. This is not just yeah. your only business. Mm. Would you be kind enough to share what other enterprises you're involved in? Okay. Um, very exciting new venture, to call it, what is Tsoka Africa. And um, Tsoka Africa is a collective of entrepreneurs who have done fantastic things in this country. Um, 
pretty much all under the age of 40 uh, and have rallied the troops to say, how do we become the difference? And we, we were very challenged uh, and challenged by a thought process that is ingrained in our society of waiting for change to happen. Instead of initiating the change. Being the change. Mm. Being the change, yes. And I said, we may mess up a thousand times before we get there, but we want to start a process. And that process is saying, well, with all the mistakes we've, I've made and all the mistakes eight other entrepreneurs made, we could come together and actually create bulletproof entrepreneurs. Not to fall into the traps we fell in. I mean, you know, getting fined by burrs and all of these things because you're not financially inclined and so forth. So we set up a skill set and we go and work with entrepreneurs to tr try and, I don't like to use the word scale, it's very VC, mm. and try and uplift them to benefit this country. Let's be honest with them, Kobe. we have maybe 10, 15 years left of diamonds you in this country. You prefer the word grow. Grow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's more, it's easy to grasp. So we would like at Soha Africa to replace the diamond revenue in the next 10 years by having actual businesses that do that. that yeah, but what are the mechanics of it? How does it actually work? So we spend maybe about two and a half months on vision and focusing the entrepreneur on creating a vision that has impact on people's lives, on the nation and the continent as a whole. If that vision doesn't align to that, we're not interested. The finance part of it w comes much later in, in, in what we believe should be the growth pattern of, of where this business must go. Mm. We create a vision where it's either product or service based but has impact, one, to create jobs, two, to benefit this economy, and three, to cre modernize the culture of who we are as Botswana. Because we, we if Mr. Mahobe, being an elder statement, a statesman and a mentor to a lot of us. <laughs> Thank you very much. Somewhere along the line, the, the culture is thinning out. Mm. So at Soka Africa, what we've done is we've even created a board structure based on the Khotla. Wow. To try and keep the ethics of who that we appeals are. appeals to me because I'm a headman at, at home. Yeah. I'm a headman of a Khotla. So yeah. <laughs> that appeals to me. And why do you disqualify people over 40 such as myself? Um, one was we were very fortunate to do the Stanford Seed program. Mm -hmm. um, and all of us in there did that. So we created okay. a, a very unique bond mm -hmm. where we, we actually started talking about this mm -hmm. with tears in our eyes and, and saw the need to do it. And, mm -hmm. you know, and it all started with sitting around in circles and people saying, ah, why is it there? Doesn't do this. And, you know, government needs to do this. And we turned around and looked at each other and said, well, what are we doing? Yeah, we also the people the so part of the system so what Soka Africa wants to do is create an environment yeah that is based on what are we doing and not what government is doing what government is very busy uh, whatever is happening there they they, they are doing something mm. but we as entrepreneurs can create an environment of our own for it to are succeed. there specific projects you've identified yes um, because of documentation and, and so forth. We can't really discuss no. those projects okay. right now. And how does um, a, you know energetic, aspiring entrepreneur become part of Tsukha? Uh We actually have deciphered a lot of companies that have been benefactors of LIA and CEDA and so mm. forth. And, and we've extrapolated lists and you know we go and visit them. We, we see where they are. We, look, we get turned down a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. as well and we turn down a lot as well because we do not want to get into businesses where it's based on tenders or based on mm -hmm. a very small subsect mm -hmm. we want to have we want to we want to meet businesses where we can see this has the opportunity to become global mm -hmm.
and most entrepreneurs, yes, have the opportunity to be global. But Mr. Mohobe, you would tell the, the listeners better than I do. Mm -hmm. This journey is made with tears and scars. Blood, sweat and tears, yes. Th there's, <laughs> there's not much luxury mm. in, in, in this world. And you have to pick that up early with an entrepreneur. That What is the objective behind this person doing this? Mm. One of the amazing things we realized is a lot of people are product focused. They, they have tunnel vision into their product and they're like, oh, you know, Safalana doesn't want to put my product in the business. And uh, I always say, if your product sells mm -hmm. and is selling units and you put a, t a paper in front of a buyer and say, well, I'm selling 10,000 of these units and I can drive those feet into your store. Mm. They're not going to say no. No, they won't. They won't. They're, they're, <laughs> not, they're not going to say no. And then plus, like, we, we, we've run some Brilliant. test pilots. Mm. We've done some test pilots and we said, okay, I'll get you the opportunity to be in a store. Put your thing. How will the consumer know? You have to market. Yeah, you could be a cosmetic amongst 10,000 different cosmetics. Mm. Are you going to stand there in the store and, and tell people about it? And the other thing we need to, 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 to pull away from is people are not going to buy products because you are locally made. That mm. cannot be a value proposition. That's not enough. It's not enough. Mm. If there's two items of cosmetics here, and one is locally made for 100 pula, and one is for 50 pula, but this one tells me, the 50 pula one tells me a great story, <laughs> and the one which is 100 pula is locally made. Mm, but silent. <laughs> but silent. It's mm. not telling me mm. the story behind it. Which one am I going to be attracted to? Yes. I can tell from what you are saying that you you read widely yeah. and that you are you know you you are exposed to to uh, to learnings a lot. Mm. You want to share what is your source of learning and what books and things like that you are interested in? I I read a lot of history and and leadership history because I believe there are messages subliminal messages in these books. Mm that were guides on, you know, today we, we, we're such, we're such a, a small world. And before, I always, I mean, reading the books of Napoleon, and mm. I read the whole book of Napoleon. Mm. And when, when I finished it, I realized he never talked about his destination. Mm -hmm. And that taught me a great lesson about entrepreneurship. It, he only spoke of his journey, mm -hmm. because the journey was exciting. When I reached the end, <laughs> and, 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 and pulling it back to vision mm. is a vision should be a journey vision, mm -hmm. not a destination. So you're seasoned. Wow. Destinations are boring. Mm. You know, you work hard and you get there, and then once you're there. Then what? So it's more imp it's important to keep, to keep yourself, yourself going. When going Napoleon going. wrote about his books, when you look at all the great explorers of mm. the past, they write about their journey and the trials, the tribulations, and how, and how that taught them. Okay, we're talking about vision, and to wrap up our discussion, mm -hmm. uh, can you just tell us what the wider vision is for your group of companies, including for O3 o o and for Tsoha? Look, from a personal, personal vision point of view, is the vision of, of O3, the vision of Tsoka Africa is similar. If it does not continue to impact people's lives, it is of no interest to me. If it cannot grow past, if it becomes something based on my needs and my requirements, I will be disinterested in it. Mm. Um, at Tsoka Africa mandated that this is not us and there is n no more beautiful energy that I can wake up with every morning mm. saying somehow or another I'm going to make a difference in someone's life and be it positive be it negative but there must be change 
I didn't tell you about this, but uh, there's a new feature in this show yeah. where the guest is given an opportunity to ask a question to the host, myself. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you have to come up with a question to put to me as we come to okay. the end of our okay. conversation. Um, Mr. Mohobe, the question I have is we as young entrepreneurs as minimally, as minimally successful as we've been struggle with one thing. How do we extract the nuggets of wisdom from Baholu like yourself and even the head boy sitting out there? The wisdom that built this nation with all our amazing problems, we are uh, an amazing country till today. And that wisdom, I believe, has not been extracted well enough for us to go forward. That's a, that's a very, very good question. First of all, I want to just correct the premise of the question yeah. where you say you, are, you guys are minimal in terms of what, uh, what you are doing. I'm inspired by people like you. I'm inspired by people like Arun, people like Bissau. Yeah, yeah. There are a lot of youngsters who are coming up who are really difference makers, who are really focused. Uh, but in terms of what needs to be done, I think it has to be a societal thing. I like an expression that was used by Reko Kuala Hobe once. And so he said, which means go back to the crossroads and see what the elders did. We need to reconnect again with our culture, with our roots, and go back to the crossroads. I'll just give you a simple example. When Sarazakama, Zakhama, our first president, came up with Ipelekheng, that was a laudable thing, and Ipelekheng literally means self-reliance, self-independence, you know. Uh, and then somehow Ipelekheng was twisted into these handouts. So we need to literally go back to our roots, to the crossroads, and reconnect with the elders. There, was, uh, there is a challenge also in terms of the richness of our language and our idioms and our culture falling off. The Setswana, for instance, is a very rich language with a lot of idioms, you know, things like Morotowa Esichal Eli, which if you, if you translate it literally, it means the urine of one person doesn't flow. Yeah. To a white person or to a non Motswana, <laughs> what is this person talking about? But it's so rich, it means that there's need for collaboration, to collaborative efforts. You cannot succeed in anything unless you collaborate with others. So I do what I can with these nuggets mm. to bring people back and to re see how we can re-energize each other. And I also try to engage government through things like um, you know, Angel Network, uh, Botswana, Angel, Angel Botswana mm. Network, and things like that to say time to do something, to join with others. So it's an ongoing collaborative effort with people like yourself. Yeah. So I don't know if I've answered your question. You have, and, and it made me realize something, and mm. I think it answered very beautifully in my very simplistic mind. Um, are we looking for the solutions technically? Mm. Because if we had to look for the solutions to take, this, to take this nation forward, from an adaptive point of view, it would make us naturally go back to look at who we are. Because to solve an adaptive problem, mm. we need to understand ourselves first. True, true. So me and you are in the same, same page on that. Yeah. All right, so um, do you want to just look at the camera and say something motivational, something inspirational, a takeaway, as it were, that you can leave the listener with as we, as we part? I would like to leave the listeners with one thought process. And that would be to say, if something is tangible, it has a lifespan. The intangible messages, the intangible feelings have legacy. Everything that we can see, touch or feel will either disappear or die one day. So when we're creating, when we are thinking, let's think of the intangible aspects of what we want to do. So that will create legacies for time to come. Thank you. Hallelujah, that's a great message. 
How do the listeners reach you if they want to maybe use your companies, take advantage of your services, or they want to, you know, develop this conversation further? Okay, um, you can contact me directly on my cell phone number, which is 727862221. Uh, send me a WhatsApp message through. It's much more efficient, so I can also keep track of, of, of what I'm doing. And yeah, from there we can share email addresses and so forth. But yeah. Uh, on social media? On social media, yes. Uh, I am on Facebook and um, Ibrahim Mohammed. I do not really check it up much because I'm mainly on the company book, Facebook pages and yeah. so forth. Yeah. Uh, LinkedIn as well. Uh, yeah, pretty much Facebook, LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think Instagram yet. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You've been a wonderful guest. Right. So you've done a great job. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Uh, you've been an inspiration. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks.